Hi everyone. In this video, we are going off script to test this medical oxygen concentrator. This is a pretty cool device. It's meant for home use uh, for people with medical conditions where they need a little extra oxygen. I'm going to be using it for purposes way outside its intended use. Now, this was normally about a $300 product. There's an Amazon return store in my area and I was able to score this for about 75 bucks. Way too good a deal for me to pass up on and there are a lot of experiments I'm excited to try with this. This device is capable of taking normal atmospheric air, which is about 24% oxygen normally, and concentrating it all the way up to about 90%. So I have here a wooden dowel and if I just get the end, just barely smoldering like this and take the 90% oxygen output from this machine and aim it at that ember, you can see it bursts into flame and the flame is much hotter than a normal wood fire. Now, the first thing that I really need to test before we go any further is the safety of my setup here. So I am using this machine's regular plastic tube that it came with. This tube would easily catch fire, which is why you're never supposed to use fire around a device like this. In order to make this a bit safer, I have attached a steel tube to the end of this plastic tube. This itself may not be as safe as you might think. Steel can actually burn under certain conditions. Take for example, this steel wool. This is very finely divided steel fibers and even under normal atmospheric oxygen conditions, this can easily burn and I have used this in earlier videos to make steel wool fireworks. That's a pretty neat project all by itself. Now, steel needs to be finely, finely divided in order to burn in atmospheric air like this. A tube, which is fairly dense steel, thick wall steel tube, would not burn in the air. However, with highly concentrated oxygen flowing through the center, it can burn. And in fact, in past videos, I have made things called thermal lances, where I took a steel brake line, lit it on fire under 100% oxygen conditions flowing from a tank through that tube, and the end gets hot enough to melt rock. It's a really cool project, and the first test I wanna do is to see if this machine is powerful enough to turn this steel tube into a thermal lance. To ignite a thermal lance, you can't just stick a steel tube into a normal flame. That is not nearly hot enough. In my previous video, to get these tubes started, what I did was I wadded up a very tight piece of steel wool so that I can get a nice molten pool of steel ignited, which is hot enough to ignite the tube, supposing that the oxygenation is sufficient. Okay, you can see right away that this steel wool becomes very hot. And if I melt it into a puddle and then stick the end of this tube into it, has it caught fire? Sort of? It has sort of caught fire. I'm melting into this alumina fire brick pretty quickly. It's not quite as vigorous as my previous thermal lances. And I don't know how useful this would be to actually melt through any substantial piece of steel. But the steel tube itself is actually on fire and you can see that flame is slowly creeping backwards toward the plastic tube. Now the good thing is this is moving very slowly so I think it is probably safe to use as a countermeasure because with how slow that's going if I need to put it out I can just pop this tube off and the tube goes out. Wow, I really didn't expect that to work. <laughs> oh man, this fire brick is made out of aluminum oxide which melts at about 2000 degrees Celsius. So you know that the temperature of that steel burning exceeded at least 2000 degrees. Wow, <laughs> I can't believe that worked. I still think this is a fairly good safety measure because of the rate that that tube burned. That was very slow. In addition to using a length of steel tubing at the very end where I'm going to be burning things, I have another safety precaution, which is this section of tube 
which is splitting up the length of plastic. So if this end of the plastic catches fire, if the flame reaches to here, it will have to actually ignite this tube before it can travel further. That should really slow it down, and I doubt this burning plastic will be nearly hot enough to actually ignite this steel. Now, if you're anything like me, I know you're wondering what it looks like if flame reaches a length of plastic tube, so let's see what happens there. This is a piece of polyethylene tube. Pure oxygen, or I should say 90% oxygen, burning inside a piece of polyethylene tube. A little harder to get off than I thought. <laughs> Uh, I got it off from the other end. Nasty. And here is a piece of vinyl tubing. Whoa! A little more vigorous, this one. And much worse uh, combustion reactants. I'm going to have to open up the doors now and ventilate this place out. That is some nasty fumes when uh, vinyl tubing burns. Now, once I had purchased this machine, I spent some time looking around the internet to see what sorts of other things people had done with one of these in the realm of science and experiments. One common thing that I saw was a demonstration to show why it's important not to use one of these with open flame around for its normal medical purpose. And that is, if you're lying in bed with the output of this machine in your nose, the oxygen could be creeping down and getting into your clothing or the bed that you're laying in. As that oxygenation level builds up in the fabric, if a spark ignites that bedding, it could go up way faster than you would ever expect. Now that demonstration is to take a pipe cleaner and make a little fella that goes into an oxygenated container. And I'm going to light this on fire in a moment, but under normal conditions, you can see that the pipe cleaner it really doesn't readily combust. In fact, I have to hold the flame there for quite a while before the plastic fully melts and ignites, and then it's quite easy to put out. That's going to change in this container, which by now has reached a 90% level of oxidation. Woo! Oh, don't break my container, please. Whoa, that was the steel wire burning. <laughs> oh, whoa. Okay, I probably should think better of grabbing that with my bare hands. Yeah, so the steel wire actually melted. There's little bits of steel stuck to the walls of the glass. I'm really glad I didn't break this container because I'd like to use this more than once. So I kept having trouble with the cheap plastic lined pipe cleaners that I was using for those first tests. The wires kept melting and I'm afraid that I'm going to break the glass if it keeps falling off the top. So I switched out to these heavier duty cotton lined pipe cleaners and I think these will work much better. So let's give this a shot. Much better. <laughs> Man, that is such a such a cool demonstration. Look at that, there's the steel wire burning at the bottom, but uh, so far the uh, wire at the top seems to have held, so we're all good. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> you can tell the flame in these shots is super bright, and I have to turn the light sensitivity of my camera about as low as I can make it in order to capture the flame properly. I think I only properly exposed one of these shots, and I tried this many times. <laughs> Poor little fella never stood a chance. <laughs> ah, I'm not alone in wanting to see steel wool burn under these conditions, right? Let's give that a shot. Woo! <laughs> Much faster than in open air. Actually, is there a thermite reaction that occurs when molten steel hits sand? Is that like a silica thermite? I'm not sure. If that's the case, let me know in the comments. I don't think steel reacts with sand. I know aluminum and magnesium do. I think steel is uh, one step down on the reactivity series to be able to do that. Pretty cool anyway. 
Now, I do have more experiments I want to do with this machine toward the end of this video, but before we put this chamber away, there's a couple more things I want to try. The first thing is to burn a sparkler in a high oxygen environment. These are a very particular kind of sparkler. They're a uh, Japanese variety called Senko Hanabi. I actually went to Japan to learn from a master of the craft how to make these sparklers. I have a few videos on that subject on my channel. I'm really interested to see how these perform in this environment. They're a very unique kind of sparkler, and I think we'll see some interesting effects. Okay, so I'll get this sparkler going outside of the chamber, lift the lid off that, and then dip this slowly in, and we'll see how the sparks change. I probably don't have to get this going to quite the extent I normally would because the oxygen is going to provide a boost. So here we have some normal sparking action. Very good. Whoa! <laughs> oh man! Wow! <laughs> that was cool, man. Okay, there's a few things I want to try with this. Oh, that is so cool. That is way more interesting than I thought it would be. Oh man. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to load up one of these sparklers with a lot more powder than I usually would. I'm going to load this up with so much that the drip actually falls off the end of the sparkler and down into this sand here. And I think if I do that, it will keep burning once it contacts the sand and we'll see a lot of sparks come off even with the drip not being supported on the paper stem. Question is, can I get this drop to hang on until I get it over the container? Because it's quite large. Yeah, it kind of worked. Kind of worked. I think I can do better. Man, pretty interesting. It's not quite sparking as much as I hoped. Okay, so we are going to try a slow motion shot here. Once I get this lit, I'm going to lower this into the tank. And then I'm going to have to hit the record button on my camera as soon as the effect that I want to see is done. Oh yeah! <laughs> I nailed it, man! Oh, it's too bright! It's too bright, I gotta lower the exposure. Alright, we're gonna do it again. At least you can kind of see what's going on, but man, when that flame gets going, it is very bright. Wow, is that bright. Still, pretty cool. So one of the first uses that I thought of for this machine is an oxy-fueled torch. And what I want to test now is if the output of this is adequate to fuel an oxypropane flame. Now, an oxygen torch, that is a torch that burns a normal combustible gas like propane or acetylene, and then adds oxygen to increase the temperature of that flame, can reach much higher temperatures than an air-fueled torch, like you would get off the shelf of a local hardware store. This should be able to reach a much higher temperature. And what I have here is just a test design that I threw together on my workbench. This is a steel 5 16 inch brake line, which for you metric folks is about six millimeter internal diameter. And then I have my normal steel oxygen line running through the center. To hold this oxygen line directly centered in the middle of this brake line, I used a punch to hit some divots in a triangular shape into the wall. Two sets of these divots holds that line directly in the center, so we will have propane gas flowing through the outside of this brake line, and then oxygen coming through the center. 
Uh, to supply the propane, I pushed in a secondary steel line, which only goes partially into the back of this tube. And temporarily, just for this test case, I'm holding everything together with hot glue. Really janky, I know. But if this works, I can replace it with epoxy or even braze something together so that it's a permanent design. So let's give this a try. I have my propane line coming in here, which I will turn on first. I'll ignite the propane flame, and then we'll turn on the oxygen generator and see if we can really increase its heat. Okay. So obviously this is a very soft flame. I don't have a nozzle on the end of this, so the flow is unrestricted, and that makes the flame quite soft. Just by the brightness, you can tell that this is significantly hotter than it was before I turned on the oxygen. This is a piece of steel I have here. Let's see if we can heat this up and perhaps even melt it. So the question is, am I using too much propane or too little? If I turn the propane down, we'll get a much more oxygen-rich flame, which if the propane can heat that steel hot enough, maybe the steel itself will ignite just like the thermal lance. I'll start on the very tip of this steel and see if I can get that corner to combust. I'm kind of surprised that this is not working very well. I, I guess just because of the softness of the flame, I'm not using that oxygen supply very efficiently to burn the propane. Much of the propane is blowing by and just reacting with normal atmospheric air. And so we're not reaching a very high flame temperature over the entire, like the entire size of the flame. There's just a very, very hot small section in the middle, which is oxygen fueled. I should say oxygen enriched. So this machine does have an option to decrease the amount of oxygen made in exchange for a higher flow rate. So let me turn it down to about 45% oxygen, but about double the flow rate. I mean, that looks much better. Let's see here. That's weird, man. That flow rate's too high. Well, shoot, I don't know what to say. I've been heating this piece of steel for quite a long time and it's still not even red hot. An, an ordinary torch would have easily made this red hot by now. So even with the additional oxygen, the soft flame is just not doing it. Let's uh, turn this off. So that's too bad. This did not work as I hoped. Uh, now they do sell small propane oxygen torch kits, which are meant to run on tiny little disposable tanks of oxygen. Uh, the problem with those is that oxygen is not a gas that you can compress into a liquid at room temperature. It actually has to reach something like negative 120 degrees Celsius before you can compress it and make it into a liquid. So you don't get very much volume of gas in an oxygen tank. So this would have a huge advantage if we could use this in a torch of being able to produce oxygen pretty much indefinitely without having to replace tanks or going and filling them regularly. I think this might have a chance of working if I went and purchased one of those off-the-shelf propane and oxygen torch kits that would actually send the gases through a nozzle that is meant to combine them, mix them together before they exit that nozzle tip. And in that way, they have a much hotter combustion and they also focus the combustion a lot more precisely, more like a torch flame and less like this soft candle flame that you see here. Well, we have reached the final experiment I have prepared for this video, and this one goes way back to the early days of my channel. If you were around seven or eight years ago, you might remember a video I did about making a hybrid rocket engine using pasta as the fuel source.
Hybrid meaning that we have a solid fuel source and a gaseous oxidizer, in this case, pure oxygen. Now, in that older video, I took a jam jar and filled it with yeast and a little bit of hydrogen peroxide to create pure oxygen gas in that jar, which then came out through a hole in the lid and fueled the pasta. This, of course, didn't create any thrust. It's just a fun demonstration to show how a hybrid rocket engine works, and it's a fun one that kids can do at home. This is going to be a little bit of a more advanced demonstration, and what I'd like your help with is how to perfect this setup as a demonstration piece. So right now I have my oxygen line coming in to a steel brake line, which then goes down and up through this uh, dowel drilling jig. This just serves as a heavy piece of metal that the pure oxygen from this machine will not be able to catch on fire, at least not easily. So this is a fairly safe setup to combust something at the end of this line without causing any secondary fires. Now, the shape of this jig is such that with the oxygen outlet protruding through the top, I can then place a piece of pasta over it and ignite it, and then we'll get our rocket effect. Now, the experiment I'm thinking will be to have different nozzle designs made out of a natural clay. Now, it's important that you use a natural clay, not a air-dry polymer clay, which could actually combust under high oxygen conditions. A natural clay, which is made out of silt, and basically just ceramics is not going to be able to burn. So I take this clay and I mold it around the oxygen outlet on this device and then place a pasta noodle over top. And this creates a seal around that noodle. So I have these wooden matchsticks here that I can use to form my nozzle. I'll place my clay over the top of the noodle and then stick my matchstick in the middle and rotate it around to form a convergent divergent nozzle shape. So now we have an actual rocket engine. We have the fuel, we have the oxygen supply, and then I will use a piece of cotton twine as the fuse. And this actually will work as a fuse under high oxygen conditions, as we'll see. I can even lick the end, and even when wet, this will still burn very vigorously inside this noodle and should cause it to ignite. So here is my piece of cotton string, which will act as my fuse, and I will place this inside of the noodle and then place this on its side. Let me turn on the oxygen machine and we'll see how this works. All right, hybrid rocket, test one. <laughs> I really like the transparency of the noodle, which lets you see the light from the flame as this gets started. That's part of what I think makes this such an interesting experiment. <laughs> it makes a really fun sound. And of course it doesn't last very long. Eventually it burns down to a nub and penetrates the pasta shell housing. <laughs> this is some of my uh, intumescent expandable graphite coating from my last video. <laughs> Yeah, pretty cool to see the rocket activate it. So here is my question. Uh, this is obviously a very simple demonstration and there isn't a lot of variability, uh, for example, to make different nozzle shapes. I've used uh, these matchsticks to make that convergent divergent design. I've also tried molding the clay over various formers, but the result is really just the same. I just don't know where to go with this experiment to make it more interesting. And I know there's something here. This could be a really fun demonstration if I could figure out the right combination of things to give it that variability where kids could participate in making their own rocket. It's essential that we use soft materials like clay and pasta so there's no explosion risk, at least no explosion risk that could send something hard flying in any direction. Of course, if I was to do this around kids, it would be in a 
caged off environment, I would have this surrounded with plexiglass or something of that nature, so that just in case there was an issue, everyone would be safe. Even so, I want to keep the material soft. I think this is a great demonstration as is as a one-off, something that I could just do in front of people and it would be fun to watch, but only for a few minutes. To really get people involved, I think it needs to go further. Let me know what you think below. <laughs> Blow out. <laughs> There's the end of the nozzle. Just starting to get warm. Since the clay is still wet, the nozzle stays relatively cool. Well, this is the final experiment I had prepared for this video, although I still do have a few extra ideas for what this machine might be useful for. If you have more ideas that I did not touch on, leave me a comment below. I'd really love to hear from you, whether it's about this experiment or something else. You can always support me on Patreon if you really enjoy what I do here. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. <laughs>